Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Professor Michael. I think uh, it's already noon yeah, in Melbourne. Okay, and first of all, I would like to welcome you all yeah, to our guest lecture series and uh, organized by the Accounting Department, the Faculty of uh, Economics and Business at Langa University. Today, uh, we have our distinguished speaker, yeah, uh, Professor Michael. Professor Michael Duffer with us. And my name is Damien Asetion. I am the moderator of this uh, guest lecture series. Okay, so uh, I think before we, I think it's not the first time yet for, for Professor Michael yet to be here. And we greatly appreciate it for your willingness, uh, Professor Michael, yet to share 
your knowledge and expertise yeah, with us. And okay, am I audible? Can you hear me, Professor Michael? Okay, because I cannot hear your 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 voice. Can you hear me now? Okay, that's perfect. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So before we uh, proceed yeah, to the main session today, uh, first I would like to just remind you regarding the ground rules yeah, or the Zoom protocol. I believe that the participants are already familiar with the protocol, but just to kindly remind you uh, about these uh, rules. Yeah. Let me share. Okay, first, uh, the guest lecture is being recorded and live uh, stream, streamed. And then I hope that you don't have any, any objection yet to this uh, rule. The second one, uh, please stay muted. Yeah. Please mute your laptop here. Yeah. So there is no uh, sound or voice yeah, coming from your laptop. Second one, uh, if you don't mind, so turn on your camera and then use Zoom virtual background that has already uh, uh, distributed by, by the uh, committee uh, and then use it as your virtual background and then rename the Zoom account, your Zoom account in the format of name, institution, name, and so on and so forth. And then we will have uh, the Q&A session yeah? and then if you have any question and then you can just write the question using the slide.do. Yeah? And then I will read your question after uh, the lecture uh, by Professor Michael Hans. Yeah? And then please treat everyone uh, just like you would like to be treated. Okay. So, uh, Professor, Ma next I will just read the curriculum vitae of Professor Michael. I, I believe that we are familiar with him and then he is our distinguished speaker with a lot of uh, things that I think can, we can learn from, from him. So, okay. so Professor Michael Deferon uh, is the chair of accounting and business information system at the University of Melbourne. And for over 30 years, yeah, both in Australia and internationally, he has led industry engaged research project in data analytics and business intelligence, and finance reporting, risk management, data governance, ethics, uh, among others. Yeah. So I think that uh, he is a multi talented uh, speaker. Yeah. And then uh, some of his project and publication, yeah, I think it's only a few that we can read here. Yeah. I believe that. The list is longer and longer, but we will just uh, show some of them. In 2022, uh, he has a project regarding financial reporting, insight and future horizon. In 2021, uh, he has a project related to data collection with AS ASP. In 2022, uh, he has a project about robotic process autom automation. And in 2022, still in 2022, she, he has a project about enhancing fairness in algorithmic decision making through perspective taking. And in 2021, another project about explanation as discourse. Yeah. And in 2019, about reconceptualizing synergy to explain the failure of this analytic system. So this is the publication of uh, his publication. When we talk about uh, his publication, I just checked through the Google Scholar, my <laughs> Professor Michael, and you have a lot of, lot of publication. I, I believe it is more than 40 articles that are already published in yes. reputable yeah, journals. So it's very amazing. And then, uh, you know, Professor Michael, yeah, I think this, uh, the title of our, your guest lecture today is about artificial intelligence, uh, or analytics, uh, accounting, and the business of data. So it is just, I, I think it's just uh, very suitable uh, for our, especially, especially uh, for, for our programs in the bachelor and master program, because last year we just revised our curriculum. And then uh, we 
added uh, data analytics as a mandatory course yeah, for students. And it is not Excellent. only, yeah, it is not only for bachelor student, but also for master master student as well, yeah. Because yeah. we believe when we talk about accounting, and then the future of accounting will be related to data analytics, yeah, with related to artificial intelligence. Yeah, that's what we believe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I I believe that in today lecture you can uh, enlighten us yeah, about further yeah, about uh, about the, oh. the roles yeah, of of AI and analytics yeah, in accounting. Okay, I think uh, without further ado, yeah, I turn it to Professor Michael. Tara Makasi, uh, thank you very much for, for the welcome. Salamat Datang, uh, name is our Michael. Uh, <clears throat> uh, it's my pleasure to, to be here and share with you again. I really enjoyed the uh, the lecture I give, gave earlier in the year. A uh, bit of a different topic. Last time was very much financial accounting, financial reporting oriented. Uh, this time we're going to be looking at some of the things that I'm doing in the AI analytics space uh, in accounting and business. And one of the things I just want to start by highlighting there, this is not about the technology. That's not the story we're telling here because the story isn't one about technology. And so it is a place where us as accountants have a really big role to play in, in what we're doing and uh, using the technology to our advantage rather than letting the technologists and the technology uh, dominate us. So uh, hopefully you'll find what I've got to share interesting. So let me just share my screen with you. And... So AI analytics and the business of data, and there's a range of different elements that will come across in what I'm going to look at today, some of the different things that come from the applications. And as we go through, I'd like you to think about this from the accounting perspective. So you'll be looking at the information, the decisions, the risks and controls that are, are, are going on in the data and where the accounting system sits uh, in this. And sometimes there's issues also of ethics and the ethical challenges that these sort of systems create for us. And we'll have a look at those, which again gets to the control elements that we're going to play with. So I want to start by really just highlighting a lot of people get concerned about AI and artificial intelligence analytics going to take over the world. I'm going to be out of a job. The, what do I need an accountant for? I can get my AI machine to, to, to deal with it. I don't need advice about reading financial reports because I can get an algorithm that's going to be instantaneously reacting to market news and sentiment, read the financial statements, work through all that. I can get um, AI and machine learning systems to look at the sales and cost data and work out who my most profitable customers are. So I don't need the accountant to analyze those sorts of things either in, in what I'm doing. Um, I can forecast what the future might be by using AI and analytic systems to extract the patterns out of the historical data. And the big one for a lot of those going into entry-level audit roles is, well, why do I need an auditor who traditionally used to come and look at a sample of transactions, follow them through the process and say, yes, okay, the accounting's been done right here. Now I just get a, a machine system that runs through every transaction through the entire organization, identifies those that look funny, highlights those, and, and we don't need auditors anymore. And I think that's really missing the story. And the story really here in my, my view is, let's recognize that the systems here are not um, silver bullets. They don't solve all the problems. In fact, they don't do anything that we can't do, but they do those things faster, but they create opportunities for us. And I actually think uh, we are in a far better position than a lot of other professions with the advancing technology. So if we think about what we are as accountants, we are the original business data professional. Part of the whole reason the profession has grown over years and years is because people want information to be able to make business decisions and we're the ones that were recording that information, processing that information, understanding and giving meaning to it. And that's a key part of that, that giving meaning to it. And that's something I want you to, to cling to here. When we look at AI and analytics, they are really good at finding patterns in data. But what matters is what does the pattern mean? 
What does the story that goes with that data? And so that requires understanding what the data means, what, what the relevance of that data is moving forward, or is it just a spurious correlation that's come out in the data that, that uh, didn't uh, actually have meaning or causal effects behind that? Um, I, um, I lived in New York City in uh, 2001, and I like to use this as an example because it really just highlights, if you ask the most sophisticated AI analytics tool of the day, what was going to happen on um, the morning of 9-11 in uh, New York City to the stock market, it would have happily predicted the direction of the stock market and it would have got it wrong. But if you asked anybody on the street who knew nothing about finance, nothing about accounting, they could tell you the stock market was going to go down. So we need to understand the story and the context that the data is coming from because all these analytical tools are working off a history of data that isn't necessarily going to be projecting into the future that requires us to understand the meaning of what is going on. And as we think about that, if I'm looking at making strategic decisions, well, these are decisions that I haven't made before. So I'm never going to have data to inform how that might happen. So the University of Melbourne, for example, doesn't have a campus in Indonesia. If it was making a strategic decision to, you know, partner or develop uh, a campus within Indonesia, it's got no data from its history of what it's done in Melbourne that would be particularly informative that a machine could directly say, here's that pattern that's going to apply in Indonesia. Of course it's not. It's a different context. There's different constraints. There's different enablers, different marketplaces. Strategic decisions uh, require us to understand the story that goes with the data, not just the pattern that's in the data. There's black swans, the one-off event, events that occurs, 9-11, global financial crisis, a pandemic. So all the market prediction algorithms, all the forecasting systems that AI and analytics were doing had no hope with the pandemic because they hadn't seen that sort of effect before. So relying on extracting patterns from historical data doesn't work because supply chains broke down, the world changed. And even without those major catastrophic events, we have enough variability in the day-to-day -day things. It's a dynamic global marketplace that we are operating in that makes it really hard for us to use algorithms to predict the future without understanding what the story is that's going on. These things also rely on data. And as they rely on data, there's the old saying, garbage in, garbage out. If we don't have quality data going into these systems to be able to discover the patterns that we then interpret as accountants, then we can't make good decisions with these systems. And so who is responsible for controlling that data and the data quality? Well, that's us as accountants. We're the ones that design the business processes that capture all the financial data as it moves through the organization. We're the ones that are putting the controls over that to ensure that that is a true and fair view of what's going on in the organization, that it's capturing everything that's happening there. And we audit that to, to, to ensure that that's going on. That's our domain. So if we're not there making sure that data is high quality and understanding the implications of weakness in data quality, we're going to be making a lot of bad decisions based on things that are not substantiated, not true in, in that data. And our ability to innovate and adapt is constrained if we're using analytic systems because they're based on history. They can't foresee the future. They're just extracting patterns from history. We can learn very quickly because we understand the story that goes with it and extrapolate from the story behind the pattern rather than the pattern itself because we do use our causal reasoning. So from a future accountant perspective, what skill sets you need to use, you need to be thinking very much about as a problem solver, as a thinker, as an interpreter, not just an executor or a processes or a data cruncher, but what does the data mean? That's going to be the key part that we want you to be thinking about uh, if you're going to survive in the future as an accountant and thrive, because I think it's actually going to be a, a bright future for us because we have more and more data. So we need more and more people adept at understanding what that data means. And um, no disrespect to my colleagues over in 
engineering who build these things in computer science, but they don't understand what the data means. They understand how to store it. They understand how to program and process it, but they don't know what the meaning is and the context of that meaning um, is very nuanced and what we bring to the table. And as we think about it, what the revolution or evolution that we might be focusing here is an issue of, yeah, some things have changed. We've got much more processing power and technology. We've got much more data. Our markets are connected. Everything's moving at massive speeds. A lot of processes are automated in what we're doing. Um, but some things haven't changed. And in fact, they have got worse. So some of those things that have got worse are the quality of data. Uh, a simple example, uh, think about how much misinformation goes on social media and floats around. Where is the truth in the data? The quality of the data is not there. We are, I hope, smarter than what we used to be, but we haven't radically got better in our ability to interpret information. And so that uh, is a constraint, our ability to give attention to all the things that are going on in this complex world. The chasm between business and technology knowledge is uh, bigger than ever. The number of people who understand the technology but don't understand the business implications of it scares me because that's when we lose money big. Let's do this. It's a great engineering solution, but it doesn't understand the marketplace, the customers, the way the business operates. The fundamentals of business that we learn in a business and economics faculty are constant. We still have risk and return trade-offs. We still have demand and supply at worst. We still have business processes that need to operate to execute to capture the data so that we can then use that to make decisions. All we've got now is better access to data, faster abilities to process it, faster ways of getting more data and analyzing it, but giving the meaning to that data is the challenge and that's the role of the accountant. Just a quick technology aside here. A lot of people say, oh, AI analytics, the, the black box, the magic, the mystery of, of what is going on. There's not a mystery there. They simply find patterns in data. At the fundamental level, what does all this stuff do? It's finding patterns in data. Some of that is using techniques that, you know, historically we would have called statistics. Some of that is using machine learning techniques where we give it large volumes of history data and train it by exposing it to that data so it learns the patterns. If you overtrain it, though, it can just essentially memorize things. And my students would know that memorizing things isn't as good as understanding them. And that's where we start to hit problems in this. So those techniques uh, of data science, uh, AI and analytics, build out of programming and, and, and statistics, but it's just finding patterns in the data in different ways. It's not doing anything magical. They can do some useful things for us. They can help us with tasks like credit risk analysis, profitability analysis, identifying groups of customers that, that, that seem to behave in the same way. So we might make product recommendations or what goods sell together but it also requires understanding the context to be able to interpret those uh, analyses that come out, the storytelling. And so if we think about what that data is and the issues we have with the volume, the volatility, the variety and veracity of data, Where's all the data coming from? Who has the answers about it? How can we make sure that the patterns that we're seeing are valid, accurate, and complete data that they're based on, something we care about as accountants, that it's meaningful, that it's actionable, something that we can do something with? How do we turn that pattern we've observed? We have a story about why that pattern is occurring. Ah, oh, we see customers tend to buy these two products together, so I'll discount one and jack up the price of the other so that they come in, buy both in my supermarket, and I make a good profit out of that. How do I translate into action becomes a key part. And again, that's the business knowledge at work in what we're doing here. Okay, so that data comes from fundamentally, the biggest source of data in any organization is the accounting system. 
And so the economic events that are occurring in that organization, in the marketplace that it's operating, as accountants, we have the systems to uh, and tools and documentation to capture that. It goes into our accounting information systems. That might be something like SAP, for example, or another sort of ERP system. It might be um, Zero, my ob, choose your 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 system that you want there. That's collecting it in a big database. When we get to the accounting view of that, that's just a view of that data. So it's not like um, you know, 30, 40 years ago we had a paper document that we took to a paper journal that we took to a paper ledger. Those views are just different ways of thinking about looking at that economic event data. Uh, so I will look at those source document views. If I want to understand the interaction I had with a customer and what I charge them, I go to the invoice. If I want a chronological record of the transactions of a particular type like sales, I'll go to the journal. If I want to see things organized by account, I go to the ledger. And then it's from that database. Another view is the set of reports we get to um, understand in a conventional accounting and reporting sense. So at heart of this is understanding the data and the quality of the data. And that's our, our domain as accountants. So the two big things here on this diagram that we see are understanding how we capture the data, what data should we be capturing and making sure it's accurate. And then the other side is that interpretation and analysis of whatever's being reported out of that, whether it's a standard financial report or whether it's a pattern that's come out of an analytics uh, AI system that's predicting uh, something or classifying things. So let's get into what these analytical systems do and what some of the issues are with those systems. There are some challenges with them. And even if we get the data right, <laughs> um, we can have issues. So our data collection may be biased because it's based on the history. So um, if we've always done something one way, the data will reflect that. So we can't know how well a new product's going to sell. And it may look like an old product might sell better than a new product because the data is stronger about that. That's sort of confirmation bias. We have to be careful about this question of correlation and causation. Is it just a statistical random correlation uh, between uh, uh, the things that we're seeing. And one of the, the common ones they see in the, the US marketplace with this is uh, there's a correlation between uh, the purchase of low alcohol uh, beer in the Walmart type store environment, the, the, the discount retail supermarkets, and the purchase of diapers or nappies. And you sit there and say, oh, that sounds just random, right? So how do I action that? Of course, some people in the US will say, if you have kids, they will drive you to, to drink. So that can be a, a, an issue there. Maybe that's the story. You've got to get to the story about what's going on. One of the big problems we have with, with these sorts of analytical systems from an accounting perspective is we want to know the why, the meaning. And sometimes the way these systems work, even the computer scientists can't tell you how it's got the result. They're black boxes. So how does that deal with issues of accountability and the justification of a decision? I'm denying somebody a loan. I need to be able to justify that so it shows that I've not been biased in making that decision and the way that I've done that. So fundamentally, there's a trade-off here between the analytics and what we get from decisions informed by algorithms and the human judgment. And the key thing that we've got to do as accountants is make sure we understand our business, make sure we understand the data and something about the algorithm, something about what that machine is doing so we can create this balance to bring in our expertise, our local knowledge of the marketplace and our goals and ethical considerations that we've got. And so what I'd like to do now is give you some concrete examples of some situations where this has caused problems or concerns. So in one situation with one organization I was doing some, some, some work with in the US, they were looking at trying to um, forecast demand and price hotel rooms in uh, a, a ski resort uh, type context. Um, and they wanted to replace the human decision maker. That's what the, the, they were trying to do. 
And it was an interesting situation because the system they spent lots of money on, it was looking at historical patterns. And then all of a sudden, the first time they get to this peak period in Christmas, New Year, middle of the, the North American winter, they see lots of people come in and it wasn't suggesting the price as high as what they thought it was, not as much as aggressively as the pricing was in the prior year. And this is a pretty revenue consequential decision. You're sitting there and this system is saying, hang on, I should price less. I want to make sure that I understand why, because if that's wrong, I'm going to lose money. If it's right, well, then I want to make that decision so that I ensure that I do uh, get all the revenue that I can. And as they start to understand what was going on in the marketplace, they realized that in the previous year, because of where the Christmas New Year uh, holidays fell within in the US, it meant that this year compared to last year, it has switched to being split across two weekends rather than bookending a, a weekend, which meant the demand that peaked that they had was now spread across two weekends rather than all on a single weekend. And so demand was going to be a bit lower. So you'd price a little bit lower to make sure that you get uh, a full hotel and all the revenue you can. And that could have been a catastrophic decision if they didn't understand their market. You can't blindly follow the system because we had no way of knowing this was right or wrong until we got to the story about the why mm -hmm. of that uh, analysis that was done. And it's knowing the market that's really <laughs> important, knowing your business and the market that you're operating in. You also want to know your customer. And so one of the, the, the pieces of work we've been looking at uh, was understanding people's willingness to share private information. And the more information I have about a customer, the more I can price accordingly and aggressively and sell and market to them. This is what Facebook and, and other uh, tech firms make a lot of money out because they got all the data about what customers are, are doing. And so we did, did some work where we're looking in an online travel insurance context at international travelers willing to share personal information about themselves and their travel behaviors and their but what they did on vacation and those sorts of things some really personal information in order to get a quote for from a travel insurer and we actually were able to split them into two groups so for one group they got told here's this user data control policy that allows you as a user of this system to see exactly what's happening with your data and to 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 communicate that to the organization the other group didn't get any advice about that. There was no policy about what the organization was going to do with your data. What was really interesting was the more someone was aware of what analytics could be applied to their data, the less willing they were to share their personal data that we could use for uh, business purposes. But the more we told them and gave them the sense of control over their own data, the more willing they were to share that personal data. So when Facebook or Google says, you want to do a privacy checkup and check the security of all your data, it's not doing it because it really cares about your privacy. It's doing it so it gives you a greater sense of control over your data. So you're then more willing to share your personal data. And so this is very much trying to understand who my customer is and how do they behave, so how I might interact with them. Uh, this one becomes particularly important when you start going on global markets because some of the privacy and consumer regulations in various jurisdictions, particularly like the EU, are quite severe penalties if you do unethical things with customer data. So the general data protection regulations in the EU hit an organization at most 4% of their global revenues if they get caught and sanctioned. Uh, that can be quite severe. So you bet companies like Amazon, Facebook, and Google are very careful what they do with EU customers. What about your people? And I'm going to go back now to another hotel chain example where we're trying to forecast demand price aggressively in the same way we might do in airlines and other businesses. The more demand I've got, the higher the price is going to be. And we were looking at this system, and in this case, the manager who's renowned at this one location as being a very successful manager says, I never use this system that the organization spent millions of dollars uh, on to help in improving decision. And if you looked at what happened and reanalyzed history with the 
2020 hindsight that we have, we could see that if this individual had blindly followed the system, they would have got revenue increasing by 6% over the last six months. So, well, why didn't they follow the system? Well, it was really very much about things that we care about as uh, accountants, uh, the performance metrics that they were operating on and how the decisions were made. So if we think about how the decisions were made, they thought about demand in terms of the things that might drive demand, what the weather's going to be like in town, what events might be on in town, not about a historically based demand forecast. They realised that they could document the history data to see how relevant that was, but they were rewarded based on profits, not on revenue. And rather than working to use this system effectively, they thought they could make more money by cutting costs and managing their costs better. And so that's why they did. So they ignored this system because the time taken to use it effectively would have hurt them in their managerial incentives. So the way we set the KPI for this person in this organization meant this multi-million dollar system was not being used and money was being left on the table. This is not a good outcome for the organization. It's got nothing to do with the technology and the capabilities of the technology. It was all to do with the controls and incentives and the way in which we set this up and the process, the business process that wrapped around the technology, which is the domain of the um, accountant very much within the organization. So we've got to know your people. You've got to know your business from a strategic and governance perspective. Uh, so one of my PhD students, he's a retired uh, Deloitte um, partner, and he's just completed a really interesting study interviewing uh, directors of uh, uh, Australian companies, listed Australian companies, and trying to understand how they make use of data as a critical enabler for their competitive advantage. And the thing that I want to highlight here is it had nothing to do with anybody on the board in these organizations having technology skills. Looking across a range of different industries, across different attributes of the board members, what came out was all about are the board members active? Are they willing to explore things and are they future focused? Nothing about understanding anything about technology or, or, or AI or analytics was going to, to influence whether they were making um, strategies that were leveraging the value potential of the data they have. And so it's the business view that drives it. It's the business understanding that has got to drive the decisions of what we're doing with data. It's not the technologist. Technology here is a tool. It's a tool that's finding patterns in data. That can be useful for us. <laughs> but it's got to be solving a business problem or realizing a business opportunity. And the technology just then becomes a solution for that. So understanding the business problem is the key part, even when we're leveraging things like data analytics. It really helps if you know what your data actually mean. And so I did some work with a, a telecommunications company uh, in the US and they were very interested, as you'd, you'd appreciate, in predicting customer churn when someone is going to switch mobile phone providers, for example, because you don't want them to switch. You might say, well, I'll give you a discount special price for the next three months uh, on your phone. I'll give you some extra data for what, what's going on. And so they had a whole lot of customer characteristics and they tried to predict what was the propensity for these individuals to switch to another um, Phone, phone, mobile phone, cell phone, hand phone, whatever you want to call it, provider. Um, <clears throat> one of the key things that came out was the zip code or postcode was a key variable that explained a lot of the churn rate. So depending on where somebody lived geographically, had a big influence on whether they were likely to move or not to a, another uh, telephone provider. When they then unpacked what that was, they actually realized it was a proxy for an ethnicity. And there was a big difference between neighborhoods that were predominantly African-American versus neighborhoods that were predominantly white in terms of the propensity to uh, switch providers uh, between mobile phone companies. Even having that data, that is not something you want to be doing because you don't want to say, yes, we're pricing based on racial profiles. Uh, you're going to have a lawsuit and be out of business very quickly in those sorts of things. And it's a good example of 
you know, even something as innocuous as an address or postcode may be capturing or hiding another underlying causal factor. So what does the data actually mean? Now, fortunately, in this case, the tools that they were using to analyze this data were nice and transparent and they could see that. It wasn't one of these machine learning techniques that are completely opaque black boxes. Otherwise, they would have been in trouble because they would have been racial profiling without even knowing it. So some quite sensitive issues you can see come from this, but the solutions lie very much in understanding the data, understanding the business. We've even seen in some of the work we're doing now, looking at decisions like credit approval or using target set uh, analytics for target setting, that when the system is a black box and you don't understand how it, it is um, coming out of the system, how the system is coming to that particular decision, we have problems. And what are the sort of problems that we're seeing here? Firstly, we're seeing it's impacting the quality of the decisions that are being made. We're also seeing that if I've got a black box analytic system that I don't know how it's coming up with the answer for, for a forecast or setting of a target, I'm more likely to manipulate that information or take advantage of private information that I might have and do something unethical. So the decision that I make is more likely to be unethical if I don't understand how the system is coming up because I, I, can, I can always blame the system because I don't understand how it works. So it's not my fault. I didn't mean to do this wrong thing. It was the system that did it. I just don't understand the system because it's a, a black box. And so what we're seeing here is the more these systems come around that are opaque, that are not able to be seen how they reason from the data to get the conclusions and predictions they've got, that creates risks for us. It creates risks about fraud, it creates risks about unethical behavior, and it creates risks about things that we might do that are inappropriate with our customers. It also helps um, in the decision quality. If we have a better understanding of how the algorithms are working, and in particular, understanding that there's multiple models at work here, false positives and false negative results can come out in, in these sorts of things to understand how good this algorithm is um, and what the alternatives are as a way of understanding whether this is a fair decision that's being made by the algorithm in what we're doing. <coughs> okay. What we really want to get to, though, is a situation where we are putting together the AI and analytics and the business people. So it's not the data scientists sitting off by themselves. It's the data scientists sitting next to the business person. So the data scientists can do the computations, can program the, the machine, and the accountant and business person is saying, this is what the data really means. This is what that pattern could be interpreting let's analyze it a little further so we can make sure what's going on and so we have done two major studies here one with a very large uh, software company uh, in north america that is a global company and i'm not allowed to name but you're using its software probably right now and a large european bank and we got access to anybody who wanted in those organizations to interview and talk to them about how they were using data and what their data use strategy was right down to the operational level. And to try and understand what drove success in these data-driven business practices, where we were using data effectively to make a decision to come up with a new product or service. And where we saw that happen wasn't where you had this isolated set of data scientists that, that are trying to come up with genius things. It's where the data people and the, the data scientists who are the, and computer science were sitting next to the business person who understand what the business data means, understands the business opportunity and problem, and they were communicating side by side. That's where you got a lot of the innovative products and services, innovative ways of thinking, and a lot more value created by the organization in, in how that played out. Where there was things that were fairly stock standard, then you could do that central. Uh, because then it's something you're going to create as a standard solution across the organization. But that's not where most of the value is. Most of the value is in that co-location. And in, 
if you look in recent times, you can find some interesting case studies of organizations that have said, oh, we're going to create this center of excellence for data analytics. And we'll put it over here on a separate campus to the, 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 the main head office of our organization. And they'll go and do magical things and then bring them back as innovations to the organization. That is doomed to fail. And it's doomed to fail because it's separate from the business. It's separate from understanding what those patterns in the data means. It's separate from understanding the business opportunities. It's separate from understanding the business problems. And you've got to put the two together to be able to get the best results in how that will come into play. So it's how we piece the two of those together that is is the key where we saw the most innovative solution. And from our perspective as accountants, that means we're not going to be replaced by the data scientist. The data scientist is going to be the grunt person who will do the, the crunching and programming for us. But we're the ones that give meaning and determine what they need to do to get the value out of that. And it's that dialogue that we've got to then have with them uh, to be able to do that. And so if you think about the way you're studying uh, and learning about data analytics, you don't want to learn about data analytics and think about it as something separate. Think about how it connects into accounting, how it connects into the accounting decisions that you are making, how in our earlier diagram, we're the ones that are capturing the data that is going on in the organization. We're the ones that are understanding the quality of that data. We're the ones that are, have been for years generating reports from that data. So we understand what that means. We understand that you know profit isn't the same as cash. We understand that I can easily get profit up by manipulating discretionary expenses. And so understanding patterns and interpreting and giving meaning to it that's going to be crucial if we're going to understand and leverage the technology. The technology is just a sophisticated way of finding interesting patterns in the data. Whether they are meaningful, actionable patterns depends on the business and depends on understanding the business, understanding what the business data means. That's our role as accountants in what we do. So to, to think about then what our future is, our future is very bright because as accountants, we are business data storytellers. That's what we have been for hundreds of years. That's what our role is in the future. It's not about, do I know what journal entry to do? Do I know um, ledgers? Do I know this particular international financial reporting standard? Or do I know how to calculate a net present value and use the capital asset pricing model? No, it's about telling the story, giving meaning to the data. So it's not about memorizing formulas or rules. It's about using our understanding of the data, the way the data is processed and worked through the accounting system and the meaning that we can do that. And that requires us to understand the business that we're operating in, the market, the customers that, that we're dealing with, the governance of that, the strategy that we're, we're dealing with. Also to understand the controls we're putting over the data that impact the data quality, the incentives, okay, the incentive systems, the KPIs and targets that we set that will influence whether we're creating value with these systems. We've got to know what the data actually mean, not on a surface level, on a deep level, and that's a business understanding. So the computer scientist and data scientist isn't going to come with that because it's what the business defines this as what does the business want to think of as a customer are a husband and wife one customer or are they separate customers that's a business decision that has a strategic element about how you operate are we servicing families or are we servicing individuals with the nature of our business that will change so knowing the business knowing what the data is about that business and knowing something about what's happening with that algorithm and by knowing that algorithm i mean understanding the limitations of that looking at what alternative models don't just say here's the one result what are alternative patterns what are alternative analyses of the data revealing so that i can understand which of these stories is the right story and what the meaning is that i'm going to create here and so we're going to be working with the data scientists all right we're actually going to be much more important than the data scientists because the data scientists are doing a very technical thing. We're the one that give all the meaning and value and drive that. We are the meaning makers. 
we are the data quality controllers and the storytellers in this data-driven world that we're operating in. Uh, what what you've got in a data scientist is is typically uh, one of two things: a data scientist, either a statistician who knows how to program, or a programmer who understands statistics. And both of those are quite technical things. What we as accountants are, we're business data professionals. We understand what the business data means, where it's come from, its quality, and how yeah. it will impact the opportunities and problems that we want to address from a business perspective. Yes, learn some data analytics so that you can communicate effectively with the data scientist and guide and structure them to get solutions for the business problems and opportunities that you see. Don't let the technology drive you. This should be business-led because the data they're dealing with is business data. It's meaning, it's interpretation, and the interpretation of the patterns all come down to you as a business person, not as a technologist in, in what we're doing. So that to me means we've got a really bright future because as the technology advances, we're getting more and more data to make sense of. So there's more and more need for us as data storytellers. Um, the data scientists, they'll get replaced over time because the computer gets better and better at analyzing patterns without having so much programming effort. Uh, the data storytellers, the meaning makers, that role is going to only increase. And that's what we do as, uh, as accountants and business professionals. And just to sort of give you something more that you can go and have a look at, if you want to see how this plays out, we did a commission piece of research uh, in 2019 for CPA Australia, looking at what does some of the key technologies we're looking at in the future do for us as an accounting profession. And this is a freely available pub publication. You can get it from, from the link there. And we, we track three different technologies there. AI and analytics is one of them. But we also talk about what are the implications for the accounting profession of blockchain and what are the implications of, for the accounting profession of tools like robotic process automation and the key message that you see there as business data storytellers our jobs are safe our in fact we're going to thrive uh, the future is really bright for us as long as we focus on our role of understanding the business and telling stories about the business to give meaning and turn that into action rather than being driven by the technology, uh, it's it's giving meaning, giving thought to what's going on, and I hope that excites you about the future that 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 awaits you um, in our data driven world. But it's a business problem and opportunity that that data has to solve. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, uh, Michael, for uh, the amazing and informative uh, presentation here today. And I cannot wait for this question. <laughs> Actually, yeah, you know that when you talk about uh, data analytics or artificial intelligence, and then if we refer to some textbooks, yeah, they will say when we want to, let's say, uh, learn about uh, analytics, and then we have to learn at least uh, three things. Yeah. The first one is the statistics, yeah. second one is uh, data science, and the last one is the domain knowledge. Yeah. So yeah. when we look at the textbook, and then uh, I, I, I um, what from what I understand it, yeah, a lot of a uh, portion of the textbook will talk about how to extract data, for example, from the database. Yeah. We we talk about the SQL, yeah, uh, how yep. to use SQL yeah, to extract the data, and then uh, we talk about the Python, how do we develop the algorithm, yeah, to to get the analysis yeah, and so so forth, yeah. But uh, from your presentation, uh, what I get uh, from your, your presentation, and I hope that uh, that's correct. <laughs> uh, we as an accountant I should focus on a storyteller. Yeah. yeah how, to, it... how to interpret yeah, the, the pattern instead of, let's say, finding the pattern itself. Yeah. What do you yeah, think but, about that, Michael? Yeah. If you, if you look at it, you can look in a textbook and, and get yeah. a sense of some of the tools. <laughs> and there's some art to, 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 to you know, mastering uh, SQL and, and yeah. mastering various machine learning techniques and, uh, and that. But the, 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 the context specific thing that makes the difference that is needed in every organization is someone who understands what their business data means, what the patterns that then come out mean. And that's specific to that organization. Whereas the, 
SQL is the same whatever organization you're in. Yeah. Machine learning <laughs> algorithms are the same whatever organization you're in. So your value to the organization is uh, is very high if you understand what the, the business data is all about, what it means and how it operates. The other is a transferable skill that, you know, I can replace with a, a data scientist uh, much more easily than I can replace someone who understands the intricate nature of what the heck this bit of that data actually means and give an interpretation to it. And that's the business knowledge that we bring to bear. And I think sometimes uh, we get nervous that the technology is going to take us <laughs> over and that, that looks really complex because we don't appreciate just how much we learn through our uh, business studies, a ways of thinking about problems and issues uh, 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 and understanding the context that the technologists don't have. And so for years, over 20 years, I've been teaching uh, an intro database session. And the first session, they all think it's going to be something technical about how you design databases using relational database systems and entity relationship modeling, et cetera, and how SQL extracts that. And I, I do a little very simple exercise with them saying, let's build this invoicing system for this small business. All right, and they go away. And every single time I've done that exercise, someone will stop and say, what is a customer here? And they thought they were designing the tables for the database. And they're now asking, what is a customer? Now, I don't know of a more important business question than who is the customer, right? And no disrespect to my, my technology colleagues, um, <laughs> but I don't want a computer science grad defining who my um, customer is. That's a business question. <laughs> Yeah. Right? That requires business expertise to think about what the implications of who I define as a customer. Um, and so here we are doing technical database design. They're working through this technical database design and they realize I've got to understand what a customer is. I've, you, you also see it in the way uh, of how the, the way the data gets organized actually needs to be informed by the rules of the business and how the business operates and functions. Um, and so you, you, you could see this if you think about the way banks historically have, have operated for many years, they were very much um, at the weak end of dealing with, with, with people as customers, right? They thought about things in terms of accounts rather than in terms of customers. And if you think about it, it's because in the relational database structure, a branch manages accounts and accounts are held by customers. And so they, the branch actually never thinks about interacting with a customer. It thinks about, I've got so much in savings accounts and check accounts and credit card accounts and you know other sorts of accounts, not about a customer centric view uh, because that requires putting the data together. Now, technology wise, those things are separated because that's the best way to organize it from a relational database perspective but from the business perspective i don't care so much as a bank bank manager about what accounts are held i care about who my customers are what products and services i can sell to them and part of that will go to the product mix as a whole but i would really understand the customer because that's where i'm going to be able to generate the value and so turning that around to think about who the customer is is again part of that and that's a that's a business driven question where the technology is saying no 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 the customers over here the answer over there, those things don't meet so well and so we've got to think about how those bits and pieces come together and the relationships that are set up from the business perspective and what it means to be able to generate business useful in information uh, and actionable business pat data patterns. Okay, thank you, Michael. <laughs> so you know that, uh, yeah, I think that's, that's you already mentioned in your presentation yeah, about the death of accounting profession, for example. So uh, we are worried with, with when we look, uh, let's say at the job market data, yeah, the demand for the data scientists, yeah, data analytics uh, is growing. <laughs> Faster, meanwhile, the demand for the accountants is uh, decreasing. <laughs> so it seems there's, a, let's say, I will say there's a trend here. Then the, the, uh, we want to replace or we want to compete with data scientists instead of, <laughs> instead of uh, to be a, a professional accountant itself, yeah, Michael. Uh, 
I, I think that's a that that's going to, uh, and history will potentially prove me wrong. But <laughs> I, I think that's a transitory issue. Yeah. And, and, and you know, I've been around long enough to see enough of the cycles. So yeah, um, if you were were floating around in the late 1990s doing anything that was IT related, was far better than doing anything in accounting. <laughs> um, and then the dot com bubble burst, and part yeah. of the reason the dot com bubble burst was that technologists didn't understand the business. They didn't understand the business requirements. They didn't understand the scale of those things. And I haven't seen that pattern change. And I can go back through my entire 30 plus year career of multiple examples over time where um, what technology made sense didn't necessarily solve the business problem the right way and, and the issues that that then re- led to. And so, yeah, I think there's demand, but it's because people don't know what those data scientists can do and can't do. And I think it's uh, uh, incumbent on us as accountants to say, hey, guys, we are the original business data professional and we understand what the data actually means. These guys are just moving bits around. We're actually telling you what the bits correspond to in the real world. It, uh, you'll you'll see if you look at that uh, report that I've got the way we talk about blockchain, which a lot of people said, oh, I won't need an auditor because I'll have my ledger in the blockchain and you can't <laughs> falsify things in the blockchain. Yeah, yeah. well, you, you, you can't change what's in the blockchain, but there's nothing s- making sure that the asset that you've got listed in your blockchain ledger actually exists in the real world, <laughs> right? Yeah. We yeah. don't live a soul in a blockchain world. We live in the real world. And so the data represents something. Understanding what the data represents then becomes the key part of it. And um, we've been playing with what that data means for a very, very long time. Um, And uh, I think too often we get caught up in the mechanics of, uh, you know, the debit credit accounting system and what we have to do with that, rather than seeing that as the tool and the technology that we were using. Some of that technology now is more computerized and understanding the data science absolutely we should you should be able to do some 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 statistics you should be able to to to, to do some rudimentary programming so i wouldn't let a business graduate get out um even 20 years ago unless they knew something about sql right because you've got to understand how the data is arranged and, and worked but it's about solving the business problem that I think is the fundamental part of of what that is it's what it, what it means and the technical skills uh, technical skills are easy uh, to replicate. So we think about things in terms of a sustainable competitive advantage. Anything that's easily replicable isn't going to be a source of competitive advantage. So there's a shortage maybe now of data scientists, but people will realize that running models isn't the solution. Solving business problems and making money, <laughs> that's what we're here for. And hello, the accountant understands that. They understand what the data means. They understand how to make decisions using that data. So I think the death of accounting only happens if you're one of those accountants who sat there as a, uh, you know, a glorified clerical worker, bookkeeper type accountant, mm-hmm. not someone who was giving meaning to the data and explaining what that meant for the organization and where it should go. Okay, thank you, Michael. So uh, you, you think that we need to emphasize on the storytelling skill is instead of, of, let's say, about, of, of course, we should know about uh, a bit about data science, about the statistics, but the main emphasis is on... Don't, yeah. don't lose, don't, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. So don't <laughs> just say, well, I'll drop my accounting degree and go off and become a data scientist. No, because I've seen this pattern okay. <laughs> over the last, you know, I've been, I've been programming computers for over 40 years okay. and I've spanned the business and IT space that entire time. And I have seen time and time again that, oh, it's all, this technology is going to revolutionize things. Yeah. And then you know, the hype cycle ends and you realize, no. And data analytics is the same. And it's very cyclical. Um, okay. I have a lot of colleagues in the business IT market. And it's a very cyclical market because the 
um, hype of what the technology can do isn't realized when we don't understand the business context of what's going on. And so, yes, equip yourself with those skills so you can get the most out of the data scientist who's going to be the worker for you. You're going to be their boss <laughs> and you make sure that they're not pulling the wool over your eyes. You can tell them that should take you an afternoon to do. I know I've written SQL yeah. queries, right? I know how long it takes to try and go do that, but I'm the one that's going to make sense of this and give meaning. And that's the value add. Yeah. That's where the where where the business problems get solved and the business opportunities get realised, not in you know uh, modelling something and understanding the heteroscedasticity of residuals in the time series of data that, that you're analysing. Those are useful tools, but not the driver of where the value is created. Okay, thank you, Mike. I think the situation is similar with maybe in 1980s and 1990s yeah, when we are already uh, with the growing use of accounting software. Yeah, yep. Michael. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. At, yeah absolutely. at the time, we believe that the role of account will be replaced by the software, the county software. But yeah, so I yeah. don't now have to manually go from a, a journal to a to a ledger account. Yeah. Yeah, but deciding what should be in the journal, deciding what value we should put on this asset, deciding whether to impair it or not, what mm. the interpretation of that impairment is. I mean, I've been on boards of uh, of large organizations with $25 million turnovers and discovered that people don't understand the difference properly between fixed and variable costs. And we're nearly going to scale down their biggest revenue generating mm -hmm. part of the business that had all the contribution margin because they didn't understand what the data was telling them. <laughs> You know, let's kill this product. It's obviously costing yeah. us more money. No, it's because you've allocated all the fixed cost overheads to that because it's your largest volume thing. The contribution yeah. margin is actually positive. Can do more of it. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you, Michael, for the insight. And then uh, we will move to the Q and A session sure. here with the participants. And then uh, we have several questions. Here. I will read some of them. Uh, okay. This is from Gamal. Yeah. Gamal B. Uh, his question is in regards with knowing your algorithm, what courses already included at Unimelp, yeah, accounting curriculum to provide students with the necessary technology knowledge? So, so we have. Um... We have obviously courses in the traditional quant methods. We ought to have a data visualization, data wrangling course where they're using Tableau, where they're using SQL to understand that. And we're also doing some things um, where they get exposures to uh, the basics of algorithms and using R and Python programming. Uh, so those are some of the sort of toolkits that I would be looking at students acquiring, a, you know, learn some SQL, learn some R, learn some Python. Um, that will help you understand what's going on in how these things are working. But it's it's to solve the business problem. It's giving the meaning to it. How we then visualize the data is a big one because it's very easy to manipulate the visualization of data yeah. to tell a story. Eh? And that's, again, part of the the, the, the patterns that are going on. And, <laughs> and they are, um, that's a very... Um, contextualized thing. One of the early jobs I had was developing a reporting system. And I said to, to the, the CFO, oh, it's much better if we report it this way, because you'll get a, a clearer pattern of what's going on. And this was about whether to do a, a month by month average on some data or a, a, a rolling 12 month average. He didn't want the rolling 12 month average. I said, but this is the, the, the better analysis to do a rolling 12 month average. Yeah, but if I have a calendar year average as the numbers go on, they look less volatile by the end of the year. So I can go to the management team and say, look, guys, I'm getting better. I'm getting more control over time. So yeah. there's very much behavioral implications of the way the data gets visualized and reported that we understand as accountants that aren't about the technology. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Michael. Uh, from my experience, uh, myself here, yeah. I teach the data analytics and in that course, I teach students about the visualization as well, Michael. Yeah. And yeah, yeah I, I show them how visualization can mislead the, the, the user. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. and, exactly. And then yeah. the, the situation that we uh, experience here nowadays when we look at the uh, social media, for example, they use the visualization just to mislead the yep. user. So, someone Absolutely. I mean, we've known as researchers for a long time, just play with the axes and whack out. Yeah. <laughs> that looks very different, doesn't it? <laughs> That's perfect, okay. okay, the next question is from... Okay, this, uh, there's no name. Uh, the question is, in Indonesia, yeah, uh, 
companies who use AI or analytics is are still scarce. Yeah. Do yep. you have any suggestion uh, for us to convince them? Yeah, to use the AI or analytics. Uh, I, I think it's a it's it start uh, on a slow journey, but it's about making sure they're getting good data and and start by showing what the business problems and opportunities are that it creates for them. So show them how if they understand their transaction data, they'll understand who are the most valuable customers, understand what products and services get sold together, understand which location in in, in a uh, in a multiple site organization is performing better by the way in which they can view the data. So show them by going to it from the business problem and opportunity that's there, not about, hey, we've got this new technology. I think we should use it. Um, it's a Technologies are a solution. What is the problem you're trying to solve? Um, otherwise, there's no value justification for it. Okay, thank you, Michael. And then the next question is from uh, Sri Rwandi. Uh, what additional skills? should accountants have for technological challenges? Uh, so some of the areas I would start to focus on, um, we mentioned SQL, R and Python. The uh, Tableau is another good one. Um, though these things will, will, will change over time. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, the other area that you're seeing a lot of things happen, particularly for those just um, coming out from a, uh, their degree, skills in robotic process automation platforms. Because what's happening there is those tend to be very business-led uh, and they tend to um, require you to understand what the process is. So traditionally, as accounting grads, a lot of people go off into audit, right? With one of the big accounting firms, because that'll help you understand how lots of different organizations work and you'll see the business processes intimately. I think moving forward, we're going to see more and more of that is you're going to go into an organization and mm -hmm. here's some uh, robotic process automation tools, automation a a anywhere, for example, or, or one of the others. And, you know, um, using those to automate what is a, a manual process. And what's exciting about that is you automate all the boring parts of the role and it leads you more time to deal with the value add. So um, in the work with the project you mentioned uh, in, in the introduction, we've done um, work with six different organizations looking as they roll out robotic process automation in uh, their finance functions. Where it's been successful has always been a business-led initiative and the employees were initially very nervous that they were going to have their jobs taken and as soon as they realized what it was done they became the most um, devoted advocates for this technology because they could see it was going to take all the boring drudgery parts of their <laughs> job and leave them to, to solve the problems that they wanted to get and they then become much more value added which means that they get more money more promotions and more interesting work uh, and so there's i think a, a lot of opportunity there. the other interesting thing we saw in that work was with respect to external consultants and external consultants came in oh we're the experts in robotic process automation we think you should do these 60 projects here's the list of things you do and talking to the organization what they then discovered after the consultant left they didn't implement any of those 60 projects because none of them were business viable if you actually understood what the business was doing okay. and so that goes back to understanding the business um, again Okay. Okay. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, I just remember in 1990, and at the end of 99, we are in Russia. You were, we were in Russia to learn Visual Basic, yeah, Michael. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. no <laughs> talk about the Visual Basic I, anymore. <laughs> I, I'm old enough to talk COBOL programming, so there you go. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, the next question is from. Uh, okay, there's no name. Uh, the question is, if accountants almost find the era of death due to machine and technology, then what can make accountants more valuable than machines? How, We're more how valuable can we than, compete? Yeah. We, we, <laughs> we compete because all the machine will say is, hey, look, here's a pattern in the data. What does that pattern mean, right? What does that pattern mean? Um, it's, it's just... Uh, outputs from uh, something like a statistical model. How do I turn that into a business decision? How do I turn that into something actionable? 
is this something that is just a random event or is there something that tells me a story about what's happening in the business? So it's using that understanding of the business rather than just saying, here is a, a prediction or a classification that's come out of one of these systems. It's giving the meaning to those patterns. So if a system comes and says, you know, these bunch of customers are more profitable for you to service than those bunch of customers. You want to understand why, because it may be something that is purely a random thing that's dr driven driven that. It's not meaningful or actionable, or it may be something you can't control. Yes, I make more money out of people in Jakarta than I do out in Surabaya because, oh yeah, well, incomes tend to be higher in Jakarta because the cost of living is higher. So people spend more, you know, nothing you can control that's the difference between those marketplaces in general not an actionable sort of thing because your costs are higher probably to operate in jakarta versus surabaya and so it's giving meaning to those things because that's the part the technology will never have because the technology never has access to the real world it doesn't understand what's happening it doesn't understand that there's a pandemic on and so you know what do sales look like they were going to be like from projections in 2019 we're all wrong right yeah <laughs> uh, and you know what's going to happen next year what's going to happen in the next month i don't know uh, algorithms at this point in time in the history data i think now is a great time to show the the fallacy of relying on analytics because um, who knows what's going to happen you know is is monkeypox going to be the next covid and then we're all, all bets are off again um and living in melbourne which has been the most locked down city on the planet we've gone in and out of lockdowns where we couldn't go outside of our own homes for more than an hour a day and couldn't go more than five kilometers from our home and only to get groceries and only one person from the household was out. That dramatically changes the way things operate um, and the way markets operate. You saw some businesses fold. Um, that's going to happen. But understanding that, where's the historical example of that? There isn't. All right. So there's there's reasoning about that and giving the story. And there's a lot of variability in between that. As events are happening all the day, all the time, what do they mean? Um, a new competitor opens up. How does that change your ability to forecast what your sales are going to be? Because all your history of the way a sales performance happened, the seasonality of things was based on not having that competitor across the road from you. Now you've got a new competitor. You've got to make some judgment with that. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Michael. Yes. Uh, if you look at, for example, to the uh, AI in stocks here, Michael, you know that mm. some AI has a capability to even uh, give a uh, give a let's say a, a suggestion uh, whether you should buy or sell your stock yeah. there. <laughs> so, and, is, it, look, is it possible for the let's say the accounting field yeah, to to have that situation as well? I I don't think so, and I don't actually even like the, the algorithmic trading because you're really trading on uh, very you're not trading on the intrinsic value of the firm, mm, right? Yeah, when when yeah. you're doing a lot of that algorithmic trading, you're trading purely on a data and you're purely saying, I'm going to be there fast because I know the way the market might move. But that's that's a constant competitive game that you're yeah. never going to, to win at because it's not about <laughs> understanding the fundamentals. I mean, you go back to rudimentary finance. This is what they call technical analysis and doing the charting. That's just charting on steroids, right? Mm, yeah. And we know that that's fundamentally not the way to, to track intrinsic value mm. and to really get their technical analysis. You know, yeah. I, I, yes, you might make some money in the short term, but you can also lose. And I, I give you a concrete mm. example. Have a look at long-term capital management. Google that organization. It was a bunch of people with Nobel Prizes in economics who were playing with models and doing algorithmic trading. And they thought they had it so good they were borrowing money to invest in the marketplace. They went bankrupt badly. <laughs> um, and these are people with Nobel Prizes in economics. Why? because they didn't think about interpreting the model and they saw that yes this is a one in 20 trillion situation that we could go bankrupt here but one in 20 trillion so it's next to zero yes. but it is non-zero <laughs> and so that one in 20 trillion combination events occurred and they went bankrupt yeah 
right? <laughs> so, uh, you know, if a Nobel laureate <laughs> can, can screw that up, that's where you want to be thinking about because they weren't thinking about what the data actually meant. They were just saying, algorithm says, on average, we win. Yeah, but that means you also lose sometimes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and do you lose everything? So, yeah, they could have been successful. They shouldn't have been borrowing money to do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, correct, Mike. And if the algorithms are correct, of course, every of us here will get richer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a it's a short term gain. You're you're not gonna win that unless you understand what's yeah. actually happening. That's where the actual value creation happens. Okay. okay, and then I think this is the last question here from the participant. It is about the ethical uh dilemmas here for for accountant uh, when we talk about the big data. What kind uh consideration that we should take yeah, when we talk about ethical things, yeah, uh, especially uh, look, in data. Yeah, yeah, data. yeah I, I, I think that part of this is going to our whole question of, as accountants, we put in place a lot of the accountability mechanisms and management control mechanisms to make sure people do the right thing. And we've got to make sure that they're still involved in that. So the work we were doing on with target setting found that if you had a black box model that was projecting a target, people weren't then sharing private information they got that showed that the model might be wrong. <laughs> uh, why? Because the, the the private information showed that they actually could easily achieve that target and they want to do that because they're going to get their bonus. If the, the, the system was not so opaque, they were much more willing to share the information because they were of risk of discovery and stuff. So it's getting engaged in that, but it's also thinking about things from different perspectives. So we've seen in um, some of the work we've done a very different result in the way that someone will make a, a loan approval decision, depending on whether they're thinking about it from the organization perspective or the customer perspective. And part of that is when they think about it from the customer perspective, they understand the story and the meaning. Say, yeah, this person's credit rating isn't quite there, but that was a one-off event that caused that problem. It's not going to happen and they've still got to, okay, so we can move on and ignore that. It's the meaning of the data, not just the, the, the pattern that's in the data. And so though that's, I think, becomes the, the ethical considerations that you've got to, and knowing what your data actually is representing. Um, so one of the, the things that I see some organizations are using analytic systems in screening applications and hiring saying, based on our past hiring practices, someone who looks like this is the best person to hire. Well, you're going to entrench any um, bias that you've had. So, so, you know, forget ever hiring a female because if you've all been hiring male, of course, all the males did very well because historically that's what you've been doing and, and whatever the, the minority group that you've got. So you really see some implications there and it's going back to what is the, the controls that you've got in place and understanding that and being engaged with these. They're not a magic push button. Here's the answer. Let's talk about what's what what this is doing and why it's doing it and ask questions of it. So that critical thinking skill that you hopefully pick up in your university education in the context of business, that's the skill that we'll be selling in the marketplace in the future. Okay, okay, thank you. And Michael, I think this is the last the last one. Yeah. yeah. Uh, do you think that we should distinguish the I say the data analytics skills are for the best bachelor student and master student? Should we run them as separate programs or? Yeah, or... yeah. so what kind of skills that they have to have here, for example, for the bachelor uh, student and for the master student, because they have a uh, different level, yeah, let's say. Yeah, I mean, I would expect a master student might be able to deal with using the technology to solve a more complex problem than what the the uh, the undergrad will, only because the master student will have potentially have some experience that they can bring to the table. They're mm -hmm. they're 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 going to be quicker to, to think through what the implications are. So it's pushing it a bit further. I'd be, um, I don't know that it's necessary equipping them in deeper in a technical sense. Mm. Um, it's th getting to think more critically about how they are using that technical skill, because I think at the base level, I'd be very concerned about anybody coming out with a, with a business degree now who doesn't have some rudimentary quantitative and, and data mm. analytic skills, because you're going to have to use them in various ways in the same way as, you know, 
30 years ago, if you couldn't use a spreadsheet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. That was that, you know, and when I was an undergrad, it was Lotus one, two, three, then, then Excel. That, that, that's that, you know, if you, you stuck your hand up as an accountant, walked out 20 years ago, I don't know how to use Excel. Nobody was going to hire you. Right. Yeah. It's not that Excel was an essential skill in terms of you can make lots of money because you've got great Excel skills. It was a tool that allows you to solve business problems that, from which you can add a lot of value to the organization. And so for the master students, I think it's more complex business problems on opportunities and implications um, that, that you explore, not necessarily more technical things, unless somebody's sort of saying, like, look, I really want to play more in that deeper technical sense. But if we're looking at the base that's there, it's seeing how they come into to addressing more complex business issues rather than more complex technical issues around the analytics. Okay, thank you, Michael. And um, actually, I don't want to end our, our, our uh, <laughs> event yeah, Michael, because it's very interesting discussion. And <laughs> I think we can go for, uh, further and further yeah, discussing about the technology, about the data and so on and so forth. Yeah. But uh, I, yeah. Yeah, no, it's been been a delight to talk to people about what's going on. More than more than happy to to have conversations about these sorts of things. It's, um, I learn from the questions that people ask as well. Okay, thank you, Michael. And again, uh, we grateful and appreciate you yeah, for for your uh, willingness to share your knowledge and skills yeah, with us, your ex expertise as well. And I hope that uh, in the near future, yeah, you would be able to visit Asia in Surabaya <laughs> on our campus. Yeah. I would I would would love that. Um, I, I don't know whether you picked up in the last uh lecture that I did, I mentioned uh, I, uh, my wife and I actually sponsored uh, a child in an orphanage in okay. Surabaya oh, really? um, in the 1990s. Okay. So um, my wife and I, Indonesian is actually our favourite food and okay. um, <laughs> Surabaya is the place that we've always had on our bucket list that we want to go to. So when the original invite came to to, to come here for this, it was absolutely uh, if I'm going to do it for any university in, in, in Indonesia, it's got to be Surabaya. So Teramakasi. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Michael. And then I would, like, yeah, I would like to also thank all, all participants and then uh, see you again in the next uh, guest lecture series. Yeah. And see you again, Michael. Thank you very much, everyone, and good morning. Thanks. Thank you, Michael. Thanks. Thank you, Professor. Thank you.